Guys, thank you so much for coming out to the 2021 Climate Summit. This is really, really exciting, but I must say, it was it was really difficult for us to get here, right, Bill? Man, you know, you know how it is when you gotta refuel your private jet. It's, I know. It's the amount of fuel that it uses. I mean, just tons and tons. And I, 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 you know, I drove my diesel truck over to the airport and it was just so full of people trying to get on these private jets. The taxiway was completely crowded. I was waiting on the jet for like 30 minutes. I know. And I, we had, there was this huge solar farm uh -huh. and we just crashed right through it. I mean, screw them, you know, it's, but climate, climate. Yes. Well, yes. We we're need to we're talk here about to talk climate. about the climate yeah. and not the fact that our jets killed a bunch of birds in their ripped them to shreds in their engines as right. we flew into this place. And I know, I was supposed by to the way, we missed you at the uh, private yacht party last weekend. Where were you at, Leo? Oh, sorry. I was at the private uh, uh, burning of trees <laughs> party. Oh. Yeah, sorry. No, it's, it's, I love it's a ritual that we elites That's do. That's out in Bohemian Grove, right? Uh-huh. Yep. Oh, okay. yep. Yep. With the cool. giant owl statue. Oh, and so. scene, because it's getting a little too real there. <laughs> let's let's pause that. Guys, welcome to Will and Amal Alive. We have a lot to talk about today. And again, the trio is back together. Mm -hmm. It's great. In the, back in the grove. Back in the grove. <laughs> back in the Bohemian <laughs> Grove. We're here to talk to you guys. Now, our skit pertains to a particular story that just came out. Here's the headline. Outrage after 400 VIP jets converge on Climate Summit. So essentially what happened here is all these elites who are, you know, the front runners when it comes to the climate change movement are converging at this climate sum summit. And the way that they get there is with private jets to the tune of 400 private jets so much so that at the airport that these elites were landing at there was traffic due to how many empty planes were flying onto the taxiway that's it's like a legion <laughs> that's like beyond first world problems that's like one tenth of one percent problem the yeah. one tenth of one percent like a tarmac backup traffic of private jets at a climate summit to talk about how bad co2 emissions are Love it. Yeah, it's amazing because now when you go on Google Flights and you type in, you know, I'm looking for a flight from Los Angeles <laughs> to Florida, it shows you the carbon emissions of your flight. So you can choose, you know, accordingly, which one's going to be best for you. You should feel guilty for flying home to see your family on Thanksgiving. Right. You terrible pauper flying coach um, across the country to go see your grandma. But these elites, don't you dare say a word about the fact that they're flying one person to a giant plane while you're flying commercial um, across the world to... Uh, talk about climate change. Yeah. I choose the flights that have the biggest carbon impact. <laughs> <laughs> Just to, just because of what they say. Now I'm gonna like, carbon emit even harder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I go. I feed cows like the most <laughs> beans. Oh cows beans. I mean, just the the hypocrisy you could cut with a knife here. And just to give some context to the situation, the average private jet, and we are not talking Air Force One, emits two tons of CO2 every hour in flight. <laughs> no, it's a lot, but I don't care how much CO2 it emits. That I doesn't mean, matter to me. It, it matters does to matter, me. though. Why? What do you mean? We know that this no, has their, actual... No, their hypocrisy matters, but, but right. the, the CO2 from the jet, what does that matter? We know that it has actual tangible effects on the climate. Like, that is tried and true. So the fact that you would go and advocate for climate change and all the things that we need to do, like the Green New Deal from AOC, and then fly 400 private jets to this summit, is just ridiculous. No, it'd be one thing if they were going there and like talking about actual scientifically backed nuanced solutions that can actual sol actually solve environmental problems. Right. But they're just going to virtue signal. And we know that. And like we we hear a lot from um, and he has a couple of five minute videos with us. But like Bjorn Lomborg, there are a lot of these climate scientists out there who point to things that actually do have a measurable impact on how to solve problems. And they're realistic and they don't require a Green New Deal overhaul of the whole you know, world economy right. um, that send everything crashing down. But that's none of this is about actual solutions. It's just about virtue signaling. And that's what is so maddening about it. It is. Wait, where it's, is it proven that a private jet is destroying the environment? It's actually the worst form of transportation when it comes to a CO2 emissions. That's why it's but, hypocritical. But, I, but according to who? What do you mean? <laughs> according to who? Follow the science. Well, Are we going to debate I'm, the greenhouse the effect you well, I'm, I'm trying to a little bit. Carbon emissions have already peaked all across the world. Like, it's it's not the big deal that you think it is. I mean, it may not be the big deal that I think it is, but I'm saying if you're going to talk to people about how carbon emissions are harming the earth and then use the worst form of transportation when it comes to carbon emissions. I'm saying it's dumb for them because it's hypocritical. But it's not the worst thing in the world to use a private jet. Fair enough, Will. <laughs> Using a nuclear bomb would be the worst. They should be the nuclear powered jets. There should be nuclear. They nuclear I'm powered so pro -nuclear. Jets. nuclear. We are very pro nuclear. Here at Prager you. I most definitely am. But I'm also pro private jet. <laughs> oh my god. 
<laughs> Will's using the nuclear option on this segment, apparently. Listen, if people have the, if people want to take private jets, they can take private jets. It's like it's not going to destroy the world. Oh, people I'm think saying. the world is going to be destroyed because people are using private jets. I mean, so just like obviously, it's not going to destroy the world. Yeah. So but like, let's cares? just talk about the hypocrisy, especially when it comes to the climate movement. And it sort of leads us into our next story, which is Greta Thunberg and her no more blah, blah, blah rant. <laughs> speaking of effective solutions. Yes. And speaking of effective communicating of world issues, we have Greta Thunberg, an 18 year old girl who's communicating the climate crisis, which, you know, I'm not going to be ageist. There's plenty of 18 year olds who are perfectly well studied. Uh, Greta Thunberg is just not one of those people. I want to show this not video. Not like Amala. Amala is a well-studied 18-year-old. <laughs> well studied 12 Sorry, year old. I'm actually eight years old, so <laughs> take that back. <laughs> uh, here's Greta Thunberg at a rally talking about her fight with the climate crisis. No more exploitation of people and nature and the planet. No more exploitation. No more blah, blah, blah. No more whatever they're doing inside there. <laughs> Ew. Oh wow! No Greta's more got a dirty mouth. She, no more whatever the f they're doing inside there. No more exploitation. No more exploitation. No more blah blah blah. <laughs> you mem memorized that really quickly. Thank you very much. It's a skill of mine. Yeah, you good. Know? That's amazing. I mean, it's not very hard to memorize no more blah, blah, blah. That sounds no. just like your guys' speeches when you go to, you know, schools and universities uh -huh. and deliver your remarks yeah. on the topics that you are passionate about. Right. The left, no more blah, blah, blah. <laughs> no, no more exploitation. Thank you. Know, you. Thank you know what would be much harder to remember is actual statistics and facts regarding climate change and the actual climate crisis that she claims is happening. It'd be a lot harder to memorize that. Right. But that's, that's the hard part. That it's is hard the hard to do part. that. It's much easier to just say easy things and say that you want changes about something, but not right. have to actually do anything about it. Yeah, not have to actually give any actual information <clears throat> for us to how this is happening. And the left is so, it's just so emblematic of leftism. It's what they do. When I was 17, I really knew nothing. I was not vetted at all before working at this leftist organization. And still they put me on stage at the March for Our Lives. They did the same thing with David Hogg. He was 16 after the Parkland shooting, immediately was an advocate against the Second Amendment. And Greta Thunberg, again, putting children at the faces of movements that are really, really complex is a very interesting way to run your campaigns. I, I, I don't think it's that interesting. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. It does. I understand why they would do it. It's emotional. It is. And you think that this is going to affect the next generation. I mean, it, I totally get it. No, it's completely ingenious. I get exactly yeah. why they do it, but it's disingenuous. Of course. I mean, it's like the same with like, you know, conservative think tanks or something and being like, oh, we're going to put this young person in front of us to make us seem really cool. So right. people think we're cool. It's like the exact same thing. Yeah. If I can get we're like a 13 year old. We're going to put this guy to do videos on the street. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Make everyone think he's really cool <laughs> and relatable. Young kids exactly. To go ask. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, it's like if I can get a crying 13 year old telling me that the world is going to end in 10 years, then of course that's going to be like really viscerally emotional. Of wow. course I'm going to want to support whatever cause that is. Exactly. So it's like genius. Yeah. It makes a ton of sense. I it get does. why they totally do it. Yeah. The left know. is very smart. Doesn't mean it's right. No, it doesn't mean it's right. But it's smart. But it smart is marketers, smart. you know, but these are the same people we talked yesterday about Ibram Kendi and how he doesn't um, subject himself to debate. He never like will go up on a public forum with someone who's his who who is a critic of his and intellectually and defend his ideas. And can you imagine Greta Thunberg like actually trying to debate a serious intellectual? It's a no. So you shouldn't be listening to the people who are just puppeting uh, these slogans and and you know making a lot of emotional appeals. You should be mm -hmm. listening to the people who can make a nuanced argument and can actually uh, flesh out the reasons why they're advocating for what they're advocating for. I mean, immediately what they would say is, how dare you come against this young girl and how dare you insult her and how dare you challenge her ideas, while at the same time, how dare you put her at the front of a movement that she can't defend? Mm -hmm. And exactly. that's how it would go. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. <laughs> We all agree. Speaking of indefensible movements, uh, a there's been a lot of chatter all over the United States about vaccine mandates, and we have people fighting back, and some pretty big names fighting back. Here's an article out of New York Post. Ice Cube backs out of a $9 million Sony deal, Jack Black flick, after refusing Vax request. So he was set to do this movie called Oh Hell No. <laughs> That's appropriate. <laughs> that is very appropriate for Ice Cube. And this was a $9 million contracted deal for this movie that he would be doing alongside Jack Black, but they said you need to be vaccinated to do the movie, and now he's backing and out. And he was like, hell no. And he was yeah. like, oh, hell no. <laughs> Jack Vax. <laughs> Jack 
Vax. This is a Jack Vax movie. Yeah, yeah, oh, with man. the Jack Vax movie. But yeah, so this man is no longer going to be doing this movie. It's getting quite a bit of press because, of course, it's a $9 million deal. But also, it sets a really good precedent for the celebrities who are fighting back against these mandates. Oh, that's super cool. I'm watching out for that uh, Nicki Minaj Ice, Ice Cube uh, collab. Right, right. They just make a rap song, a no yeah. Vax rap song. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to see it. I was just watching... You guys seen Bojack Horseman? I know Amla has. Yes, I have this, not. In Bojack Horseman, there's like this ridiculous video about abortions and oh it's crazy. Gosh. And that's like what I figured. Aquafina. This, yeah, Aquafina. Uh. Whatever her name is, that's like what I think this would be like if they did something like that. <laughs> and it's tragically not far off because the left and all these late night TV shows and day shows are making vaccine songs and music videos and like the one off of what was Colbert. it? Colbert. It was Colbert. And he's dancing around with all the little oh, vaccines. So cringe. It Jimmy Fallon did the same thing with uh, that is poison. They got the guy who oh, sings yeah, that yeah. song. I love that song. To make a pro vaccination version of the song. <laughs> When you oh, have to, gosh. I don't know. It's oh, I didn't like, know that. Now I'm going to go go get the jab. Right. A couple extra ones just on now that. Now that I know hip hop culture loves the jab. <laughs> right. Except they oh. don't actually because Ice Cube and Nicki Minaj didn't do it. Yep. Except they don't. So, and I'm sure many others too who just aren't coming out and saying it. Yes. Many others. Another segue into our next story. Here's the headline on that article. Mark Cuban rescinds vaccine mandates for Mavericks fans. He originally came out and said, if you're going to come to a Mavericks game, you've got to get vaccinated or you have to have a negative COVID test. I think he got a lot of outrage for this, but he said he was giving a mothering ear to the people who decided not to be vaccinated and not to get a negative COVID test. But because of the response, and I'm assuming the backlash regarding this sort of mandate, he has now rolled back on it. He's no longer going to require Mavericks fans to be vaccinated or to bring a negative test to these games. Well, isn't that because in Texas, you're not allowed to have any sort of vax mandate? It says that he's changed his stance. He's allowed to do it privately, but has decided to change the stance. I thought you weren't allowed to do a private. I thought that was the point. He says fans still have to wear masks, but he can't mandate. He was not going to mandate their vaccinations. It's like in Florida, you can't go... You can't mandate any sort of vaccination requirement for a business or anything like that. So no one in Florida can mandate that. I'm pretty sure that's how it was in Texas, too. I'm pretty sure Greg Abbott did the same thing. No, I guess you're allowed because it says the Mavericks have decided, Mark Cuban himself has decided to lift this vaccine mandate on his fans. That's weird. Yeah. Personal decision. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I feel like he tried I'm to sure. do it and then it got challenged and now he's kind of just giving Well, it. I'm sure it was challenged heavily by fans, by people on the Mavericks team. Like, I'm sure it was challenged far and wide and he just decided not to do it. Well, this is in Dallas, which is, I mean, yeah. an incredibly left-wing place. It's like L.A. Dallas is literally just as bad the as LA, L.A. of Texas? It literally is. I mean, Dallas is just as bad as Los Angeles. So is Austin. Austin's They're, way worse than Dallas. No, it's pretty similar. Is it? Yes, I've spent yes. lots of time in Dallas. You said Data Girl lived in Dallas. I spent lots of time there. I mean, it was it was the masks everywhere, same type of deal. I mean, the leftism everywhere, all the flags everywhere. I mean, it was like a leftist paradise there in Dallas. You go out to Fort Worth or some of those other places, it's not obviously as bad. But inside Dallas, downtown, around that surrounding area, it's just as bad. It's just as bad as in L.A. I mean, there's not as many homeless people and it's a lot cleaner. But, yeah. but other than that, right. other than that. But, other than that. but culturally, <laughs> culturally, you know, you want to go to Texas and you want to feel like, oh, this is Texas. Like I can, I can enjoy what Texas is supposed to offer me. You want to feel the yees and the haws when you go to Texas. <sighs> the and right giddies now, and the ups. <laughs> That's what I want to feel. <laughs> and right now we're yeah. not feeling any yee haws or giddy ups. No, no. Just a bunch of, I don't know. I, I don't know if Texas will survive the next election. Oh my gosh. The cynicism. What? No, it's tough. <laughs> Look, you. Every time that, was the such a, that was just such a like a cold, dark way to. I don't know if Texas will survive. No, I, I don't know if Texas will remain a strong conservative place. I don't know if it will. Well, yeah, who knows if any of these places are going to remain strong conservative states? Well, we'll try. I hope so. I <laughs> we'll hope the try. people in Texas try. Yeah, it's important. It's tough. They have a lot of illegal immigrants coming in, and the culture is fading away. It doesn't feel like Texas in these Texas places anymore. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know. They sure don't feel like Texas anymore. No, not not like home anymore. It's tough. It's really tough. Uh, I feel like I feel like Florida and Idaho are the two like main places that I'm like, oh, these are like conservative strongholds that people are actually building up. We shall see. Who knows? Who knows what's around the bend, Will? I don't. Well, that's why we're talking about <laughs> it. Yeah, I don't know. Texas had that abortion bill. That was a pretty big win. Yes. 
But then all the women just went to Oklahoma and got abortions. There. Okay, well, that's you can't help that. We got to get it in Oklahoma. You got to make it federal. Well, yeah, of course, of course. You know, there's other be. there's other steps to take, but Texas was the front runner. So that says something about where Texas is at right now. I hope so. I hope so. And the Mavericks not requiring vaccinations and negative COVID tests says something about Texas. Still requiring masks. Yeah, I know. I know. You can never be, uh, nothing's ever going to be 100% great. It could be, but you know, that's that's sort of how leftism works. They're never 100% great. I know, and that sucks. (laughs) That's why we're fighting (laughs) against it. And somebody else is fighting against it live on air on his nightly show. This is Bill Maher talking about his feelings on the vax mandate and life going back to normal after COVID-19. I'm not not sure what the latest Dr. Fauci thing was on Halloween. He's changed his mind a lot, but I think it was go and do it. I hope so, because it certainly has been my position since the beginning of this. Just resume living. Uh, I, you know, I mean, come on, the, the, the 15 of 100,000, that's where we are cases in California. 15 cases per 100,000 people. I know some people seem to not want to give up on the wonderful pandemic, but you know what? <laughs> it's over. There's always going to be a variant. You shouldn't have to wear masks. I should be able, I haven't had a meeting with my staff since March of 2020. Why? I don't know, the state, the corporate, whoever it is, you're being, sorry again. Why him? Why is he apologizing to me? I know, because you're a senator and you shouldn't hear bad language, I forget. Never heard that word. I know, I know. um, But really, I mean, also vaccine, mask, pick one. You got to pick. You can't make me mask if I've had the vaccine. I have broken up with COVID. It's not working for me anymore. <laughs> I stayed home the first year. I was a good girlfriend. He was a little abusive. Then I got the vaccine. I right. walked out of the CVS. I hadn't been that thrilled coming out of a drugstore since I got the birth control pill in 1981. It's like, oh, no, I'm back. And it was, a, it was the same thing. I knew it's like, OK, I'm not going to need this every day. But when I do need it, it's on board. And then I barely got there, and it was like, oh, it's Delta. So I, you know, I, I just, I can't keep up. I, and you know what? I have cancer. It, I'm triple vaxxed. If it gets me, fair play to it, because it will put up a fight against me, but I'm not staying in my house again. There you go. <laughs> well, you're down with that, because it's the Democrats who seem to be, I mean, I travel in every state now, back on, back on the road, and the red states are a joy, and the blue states are a pain in the ass <laughs> for no reason. There we go. That's, exactly That's pretty right. killer. It is. That's pretty great. I mean, we've seen a progression with Bill Maher. He's just slowly but surely getting red pilled. And now it's happening at a faster rate than ever before. I sad to think that people who want their lives to be back to normal is a red pill. It like sucks. Right. You know, that should just be everyone. But it's just how Everyone's far the so left scared. has gone. That if you are just a normal common sense, free thinking person, you're pretty much on the right now because the left has left you behind. Why is everyone so scared? They're so scared <laughs> I know. to go back to normal. Because propaganda Zuby is really this, strong. Zuby had this great tweet um, today or yesterday. He said, it's crazy that some people have basically been living completely normal for the past 20 months while others have been in perpetual lockdowns, masks for 10 hours a day and not seeing friends, family or traveling, primarily based on their geography and TV watching habits. So true. We live in two Americas. I go visit my family in Oklahoma or elsewhere or mm-hmm. in Nashville and it's like different world it's it's what pandemic my older brother is like i this thing hasn't really affected my life in the, since like it would get for a couple of weeks like he lives in a suburb of uh, nashville and it's like i go to the gym i do everything i normally do and this thing doesn't even affect my life and it hasn't for like over a year right it's wow. crazy now we have mandates for yeah, me in la in things Angeles. are yeah things are getting locked down even harder even harder it's crazy how easily people adapt to it too because i remember in florida when i first heard about covid19 i'm like oh that sounds kind of scary that's freaked out and then i walk out of my apartment and literally everything's shut down the next day everybody's gone nobody's out on the street nobody's walking around like everybody's locked up in their house it was so easy to just convince people within a matter of days to go you need to stay in your house and you don't need to leave until further notice and everybody just did it it's so crazy uh-huh. and we we just went to florida and there was people still like running, jogging with their masks on. Everybody in the airport had their mask on. Like people were at restaurants with their masks on. Like it's still a thing mm-hmm. for some reason. It's everywhere. 
It's, it's everywhere. everywhere. I like to say, I went on the book tour and I went to all these different places. And except for being in New York and and DC, I mean, I didn't wear a mask anywhere, you know, right. at all. Yeah. Even if they told me to. Yeah. I didn't do it. But it's like so many, uh, so much of America is completely fine, while some the other parts of it are just like completely destroyed. All of the urban cities. I mean, I it, no matter where you go, I put out a tweet about it yesterday. We shouldn't be living in these big urban steel and concrete cities. I think it destroys us. It turns people into as just this, this big herd of people mm -hmm. where they, they don't want to be unsafe or uncomfortable ever. I mean, you're not wrong. I think it's like a natural, it's a natural human tendency these days that we've now just been, we've just like, I don't know, cushioned ourselves in the world that we live in. And now we look, like Zuby said again, we look up rather than looking in. And we look for other people to tell us what we need to do with our lives. And we look for hierarchy, which is what humans naturally do, at least not all of us, but most of us, instead of looking at and knowing what our needs are and what we need to do to protect our families and protect ourselves. People don't care anymore what the facts are. They care what somebody has told them, which is sad. <laughs> and to see Bill Maher, who is really acclaimed by not conservatives, but moderates and leftists come out and speak against what's happening right now in our culture and this massive shift we've seen in America where everybody is just complicit in not living their lives anymore and giving up their liberty and freedom is a really important thing because the people who need to hear this, the people who are subscribing to the ideology of the COVID-19 pandemic are the ones who are going to hear this message. So yeah. <laughs> Nothing, what? nothing to say. <laughs> I think you summed it up pretty well. Great. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> now, more Vax mandate news. This is the last story when it comes to vaccine mandates. Here is the headline out of the Daily Wire. Flight crews have reached their breaking point. Anti-vax mandate group responds to mass flight cancellation. Now, following southwest and their 1800 flights that they ended up canceling over the course of a week we have american airlines doing exactly the same to the tune of 2000 flights and another 300 more cancellations just this past monday now of course they came out and did the same thing that southwest did and said well it's just the weather yeah i got an email like yesterday <laughs> yeah they said yeah they said like oh it's just weather it's just the weather that is simply affecting only american airlines planes and they cited weather specifically out of the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. And apparently that contributed to 2,300 flight cancellations with thousands of people in line at American Airlines customer service in these, in these uh, airports. And what's happened now is that union workers, flight attendants, and pilots in groups that are based around being anti-mandate have come out and said, no, we are refusing to show up. We will not be working on these flights because you are trying to mandate what I'm doing with my body. And so long as you continue to do that, we will continue to do the same. I wonder if American Airlines is going to do the same thing the Southwest Airlines did. And back out? Maybe. I mean, I have a, I have a call with the, the, the person in charge of the Southwest Airlines uh, vaccine mandate or anti-mandate thing. That I got their a, group? Like a, yeah, their group, like mm. the head of the thing. So I have to call them this week and, and figure out what's going on. They wanted me to call them. They hit me up. And they're like, hey, we want to tell you all about what's going on and potentially go on the show and, and tell you the truth about what's happening and that it's actually worse behind the scenes than we're hearing actually what's going on. So I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of nervous to, to make this call. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be interesting. I, I'll be interested to see if mandates sort of surpass, uh, you know, L.A. and New York and they start getting into controlling how people travel and where they go. That would be that'll be a breaking point. That'll be very interesting to see because, you know, it's got to affect the market and the economy in a way that it's unimaginable. I wonder if they're prepared for that and if they're willing to actually go down that route. Yeah, they are. Of course they are. I mean, they already bailed out the airlines before. Mm -hmm. They have no problem bailing out them again. And so our tax dollars know. just bailing them out. Because there's going to be, Southwest was first, American Airlines is second. There will be more if the airlines continue to try and push VAX mandates on their employees. And there are going to be, be people who simply refuse. So what happens when you have that? Mm -hmm. We bail them out. That's you what think? the Federal Reserve is for. I, I I don't know, though. You can just You can literally just print money to bail out these corporations. But then you have... I mean, the, the downstream of that is hundreds of millions, millions of people in American society not being able to contribute to American society where they were before two years ago. Of so course. That doesn't matter, though. What that, happened? You so think they'll bail all of that out? Yeah, they, they've done it before. They did it already. They already bailed out the airlines. I'm sure, but I don't think we're thinking to the full extent of where this could go. I, I you know? Yeah, I mean, but I, I really think that that's what's going to happen. 
They'll bail out the banks. They'll bail out the airlines. They'll bail out food companies. They'll bail out whoever. They don't care. They can just go to the Federal Reserve and write a blank check for however much money they want, give it to this company, mm. and say, hey, here you go. And screw over the screw over regular Americans by not letting these companies fail when they do bad things. Then, and so they feel like they can get away with whatever they want. I'm sure, but what happens to that and the millions of people in society who can no longer contribute and are just second-class citizens? Just, is that just simply what it I is? Just go get another job. I guess. I think there's there's a there's a revolution brewing on these issues if they if they start to become as pervasive as I'm thinking they will become. There's a revolution brewing in many ways, not just on these issues. I mean, just in in the national debt and and you can't you can no longer survive on a one income for a single family anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, the it is brewing in many ways. And if the government thinks that they can just keep creating money out of thin air through the Federal Reserve and, and think that it's all going to be fine, it's not going to be fine. Because the inflation that's being caused by things like that is destroying America and cutting it so that people can no longer live the lives that they want to live. So it's definitely coming. The revolution is coming. I, I We'll see. I don't know when it's going to be here. I but as far as no American idea. Airlines goes, I'm going to place, place a prediction right now that if the cancellations continue at the rate that they're continuing, they will roll back this vaccine mandate. Like I saw, it was a picture from Ron Paul's wife mm -hmm. from Halloween, mm -hmm. like in 2006. And he wore a Halloween costume. He was the national debt and it was $10 trillion. And now over the last 15 years, the right. national debt is now $30 trillion. Right. It tripled in 15 years. You're not wrong. Something bad is coming. <laughs> Something very bad is coming. I mean, that's true. But speaking of debt, money to be paid and allocated, we have... You owe me money for lunch. <laughs> speaking of that. Do I? <laughs> Potentially. I don't know. Okay, well, if I do, I will buy you lunch. Okay. Well. <laughs> I, brought, I brought Mediterranean chicken. Oh, okay. Great, great, great. Well, we have a superhero coming to the forefront uh, by the name of Elon Musk. And he has tweeted out at the UN that he is willing to give them $6 billion to go towards the cause of solving world hunger, so long as the UN can simply tell them how the money is going to be allocated. I'll pull up the tweets here. Here's what uh, Elon said. Well, it started with yep. CNN yes. publishing an article. You can read that. Is that a headline up? Yes, here's yeah. the headline. 2% of Elon Musk's wealth could solve world hunger, says director of UN Food Scarcity Organization. <laughs> so, of course, people are coming out because everybody hates the billionaire. Everybody hates the billionaire and saying, well, how could you possibly need that much money? If you just shaved a little bit off the top, you could solve all the problems in the world with all the wealth that you've amassed in, in your creation of a product and a company. Let's not forget that. His creation of a product, a company, in a way that has never been done before in American society. So they say, okay, Elon Musk, if you give us your wealth, we'll solve, we'll solve world hunger. That's what you could do. And he responds and says, if the WFP can describe on this Twitter thread exactly how $6 billion will solve world hunger, I will sell Tesla stock right now and do it. But it must be open source accounting so the public sees precisely how the money is being spent. First of all, I mean, world hunger is largely solved across the, the world. I mean, the amount of people who are now living in abject hunger is, is totally declined because of capitalism, mind you, be mm -hmm. not because of the UN. UN should be abolished, but because of, of capitalism around the world, making it so that food is much cheaper, the production of food, the shipping of food is mm -hmm. much cheaper. Like you can get people food. Farming has gotten so much better through irrigation, all these types of things. Because of capitalism, world hunger has basically gone downhill. I mean, the reason why the UN is coming and saying that we need $6 billion for this is so that they can use it to fund, I don't know, whatever diversity program they probably want to fund in third world countries. Right. I mean, it, it's useless. There's so many problems that still persist around the world. Food, food scarcity is a problem. Water scarcity is a problem. Electricity scarcity is a problem in all these different nations. But regardless, just simply tell them how you're going to allocate the funds. And that's something that I'm, I'm going to place my bets right now. They are not willing to do. The UN is not going to go and release a document saying we're going to fund $500,000 towards this and $500,000 $500, towards this and give that to the public. They never will. You know what the UN wants to do? The UN wants to go into these third world countries and say, oh, we're really helping you guys and try and provide solar power or wind power to these mm -hmm. places. And it's like, that's not what these places need. They mm -hmm. need better c control of their irrigation systems when it comes to flooding and, and actual ways that they can create gas power so that they can, you know, cook their own food and things like that. They don't need solar farms in their, in their, in their communities and their little villages and mm -hmm. stuff. They need like actual solutions that have been tried and true to work. 
but the UN is same like this is what they'll do with this hunger stuff. It's all worthless. I mean, they, they they're doing nothing that's really going to be helping these people. It's all virtue signaling solutions to yeah. make it seem like they're doing something. In reality, they're hurting these people. They're literally hurting these people. And this is just a prime example of that, and it's something that we say on this program a lot, is that the bureaucrats and the elites who scream about these problems, the people who write for CNN and MSNBC and ABC, who talk about just one percentage of, of a billionaire's wealth from, I don't know, Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or Elon Musk or who whatever, whatever you want to put, whatever person's name you want to put in the blank there. This will solve world hunger. This will solve any scarcity that we're seeing in all these underdeveloped countries. Okay, let's assume, let's let's run on the premise that that's true, that $6 billion solves all of those problems. A man has come to you and said, I will give you that. Just simply tell me how you're going to use it. And they won't do that. And it goes to show that they are capable of solving all of the problems that they cry about and that they talk to you about and that they fear monger you with on a day to day basis. Yet they don't put in the effort to solve them. If you took all of the wall, if you took the CEO of Walmart and took all of his money and divided it evenly among all of the employees of Walmart, mm -hmm. everyone would get about eleven dollars. It's like saying that you're just going to take money from mm -hmm. one person and use it to to create something new or, or do something that's going to help all these people is, is just wrong. The reason right. why things get better across the world and in America is because people who have money invest in different types of things. They invest in technology. They invest in, in, in different companies. They invest in real estate. These types of things that actually help people for the most part, not all of it, but it, it's things where they are taking money and going and investing in something that then builds equity in something and then the money grows. You just take someone's money and use it for something and then they have no money that they can then use to do other things, to do other ventures. I mean, that's literally what capitalism is. Socialism is them coming in and redistributing the wealth which is worthless because it's not like the government or any the UN, of course not, they're garbage, know how to use anybody's money better than these people know how to use their money. This is their money. I'm pretty sure Elon Musk knows how to spend his money way better than some bureaucrat at the UN knows how to spend Elon Musk's money, right? right. You think Elon Musk just doesn't want to help people at all? You think he's just diving into pots of gold all day long? Of course not. Elon Musk has done a lot to help people. As he knows how to spend his money so much better than any of these other people ever will. Which is exactly why he made it to the position that he's in in our society right now. Why he's been able to do all these space explorations while also creating a, a new form of car and is constantly innovating in a way that has never been done before. It's something that people never could have dreamed of, especially not these bureaucrats who are advocating that he give his money to them. <laughs> and it's, it's just, again, pure leftism give me your money and i will solve the problems you give me what you've earned and i will solve the world's problems yeah it's this it's this false notion of that that money the economics is this zero-sum game where there's a limited amount of wealth and it's the people at the top are hoarding all of it and so we just need to take it from them and then everyone will be happy but like will saying it's it's fundamentally misunderstands um how economics works and how you create wealth in the first place which is like capitalism incentivizes people to create something of value that other people want and that's what elon musk did that's how he became wealthy and uh, when when you have a, a ton of small entrepreneurs who are in even on a small um community scale hey you need your car fixed here's my business i fix cars oh there's another one across the the way let me compete with him for pricing it, it's that's how free markets work and that's how you efficiently um incentivize wealth creation by incentivizing the creation of value and socialism does the complete opposite it it incentivizes people to be jealous it incentivizes people to be resentful it incentivizes people to um, demand that you take wealth from pe people who it punishes you for creating value because when you do you are rewarded for that and then now the the socialists come after you and want to take the the rewards of what you've done and so it, it disincentivizes it. that's why businesses are leaving california because they're taxed so heavily right. um, that it disincentivizes incentivizes them from having their business based in a place that punishes them for being successful. And we, you cannot, it's going to completely undermine the economic global system if we move toward this this idea that if we just redistribute the people, uh, the, the wealth of the people at the top, then we'll fix everything. That is such a it's it's such a false all you'll do is is cut the entire economic system off at its knees and completely bring everything crashing down. Yep. Right. Things well, like that are why the middle class is, is being destroyed. Mm hmm. Yeah, why innovate? Why create?
why make a small business and with also, all the regulation? We should always say this. Like, it's not to say that cronyism is okay. It's not to say that, right. uh, you know, being having uh, companies like lobbying for special favors with politicians and all that type of stuff. That should be heavily stamped out, punished. Uh, those people should be in jail if you're if you're exploiting the system. Um, but that doesn't it's not a, that's not an indictment against capitalism it's not an indictment against incentivizing the creation of value it's an indictment against the cronyism it's an indictment it's an indictment against loopholes that that need to be closed and regulations that need to be put in place and people who are committing crimes that need to be punished that's what we need to, that's how we need to clean things up and Elon Musk made a great point too about hey if you guys can give me transparency and accountability with how you're going to manage this money then Sure, I'll give it to you. But if you can guarantee me that it's all open source accounting, then I'll give it to you. And that is what's missing right now mm -hmm. in our uh, in our political system and in our economic system is just simply transparency and accountability. Right. Amal and I were talking about it yesterday, but that is how you root out corruption: is make people accountable mm -hmm. for corruption, make people make force them to be transparent. And politicians are not incentivized to do that. And we we're talking about in reference to these like giant spending packages where you can't see what the politician actually voted on because they can just say, "Oh, well, they're." There's a million other things in this package that I needed to vote for. So uh, it's like the they don't have accountability for, did you support this measure or not? And that's why they, yep. I'm like, that should be illegal. <laughs> like should. Term it limits. should be. Yeah. But that's again, goes back to the Federal Reserve. They can just do these package deals because they can just create money out of thin air. That's not real, you know? And so then they're able to do that. And then yeah. everyone will say, go on Twitter and say these kind of things. And they say, well, that's a product of capitalism. It's not a product of capitalism. Right. It's a product of a corrupt government and corrupt people influencing a corrupt government working in tandem. Like it's just it's just evil people. Like you don't have to put some sort of of political system on it. You don't have to say it's socialism, you don't have to say it's capitalism. You don't have to say anything. It's just people taking advantage of a broken system. That's all yeah. that it is. Yeah. You know? I was telling Amla yesterday, I'm like, we should like every bill should help only be able to be like five pages long, you know. So yeah, you can't you insert all this extra all this stuff, crazy spending the, and stuff. The pork, as they call it, yeah. within these bills. It's like the, the COVID-19 bill that they put out for trillions of dollars in, in COVID funding was hiding stuff about like digital wallets and cryptocurrency and within the bill that mm -hmm. has nothing to do. Wasn't it like... Uh like CRT training in like uh, Pakistan, Pakistan yeah. or something. Right. What, the hell like, are you doing? what does this have to do with the pandemic? But yeah, that's why it's so messed up. And mm -hmm. no they accountability for this. it. Yeah. None at all. Yeah. Someone probably got some Pakistani donor for their campaign and then kicks back something in that bill. Right. No one thinks they're going to know. And these bills are like a thousand pages long. And the people who read these bills are, they're like some 22 like year old AIDS, kid. Yeah. Some 22 year old kid who works on the hill probably got blacked out the night before and has to go in and now read this bill and relay it back to the to the senator <laughs> it's just amazing as it's though what's amazing. actually in the bill is really going to influence their vote either way oh, yeah. they right. usually just yeah. vote on partisan lines and all this stuff that's, yeah exactly that's the Bunch stuff ciphers yeah you got to get rid of but yeah. so much corruption ladies no. and gentlemen <laughs> no. no there really is there really is this is why i'm quite cynical for future i know quite cynical for a 25 year old well well, I'm very well read. <laughs> so when what, you know, what makes you hopeful right now? I'm hopeful for individual people. Mm -hmm. I always say this. I, say, I end all my speeches by saying this because I basically give about 30 minutes of, for all my speeches, I give like 30 minutes of what's wrong with America <laughs> <laughs> and what's wrong with the world so that people know. It's like I was talking with Jack Hibbs and it's like if, if, if people don't know what an abortion is, they're not going to be against abortion. Everyone should see an abortion. You should see what an abortion is and what it looks like in the stages of life so that you know, you know, what it actually is. So if I go and I tell people, here's what's wrong with America, instead of just saying, you know, everything's fine, they need to know that. I think that if people know the problems, then, then we can make changes. If you don't know what's going on, then we can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So I give like 30 minutes of, of me saying, here's what's so screwed up. And then the last like 15 minutes or so of the speech, I usually speak for like 45 minutes. It's a pretty good amount of time. Are, are how you can really be the best person that you can be. In a, in a broken society, the only choice that you have is to be a hero within it. You can only be either a hero or someone who sides with the broken society. You have two choices. And which one are you going to be? So you have to be that brave person who stands up against that society and is, is the best individual you can be or fall in line. And, and so I have a lot of hope that people right now that we're seeing are being brave and cool and passionate and all doing stuff that makes them apart from everyone else, you know, and that's great. But not everyone is like that. Not everyone's doing that.
Yeah, I mean, you the know? sad reality is everybody thinks there's a, they're a hero in whatever endeavor they're taking on. Yeah. So that's like, it's just how I mean, it you is. Can, you can't be a hero if you're living through lies. And so that it, you can't, people know, I think that people are smart enough for the most part to know if they're living lies. I think so. I, I think know. I think it's tough. I don't know. No, no, because I, I think that even if you think that you're doing this righteous thing, like you're some leftist or something, you think you're doing this righteous thing, I think that you understand that you don't know enough about something to know that there is also other information out there. I think most people realize that and know that there's a lot more to the world than they think. And so if you don't know everything, then it's hard to, you know, it's hard to know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know because I feel like the echo chamber is so strong these days that you're just constantly re reinforced in in people who are telling you that what you believe is truth and that what everybody else believes is a lie. So why even listen to it? So don't think people are at least the average everyday person is that cognizant of the fact that they are living by a lie, you know, yeah. or at least not putting in the effort to I mean, you deduce talk, whether they are. You talk about it too, like that that leftism is tantamount to a religion mm -hmm. and with that, it, it is essentially an, an ideology and it's a, it's a simplistic worldview that reduces everything to these, you know, emotional narratives of, you know, and it always sets you up as the hero, like as an activist, like, right. oh, the climate crisis, if I don't do this, then if I don't, you know, scream no more, blah, 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 then the world's going to burn, but I'm the hero for, you know, it's like inserts you as the hero into that narrative, right. but it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't follow the traditional like hero journey arc that actually means like you you need to incorporate the wisdom of your ancestors you need to um i don't know treat the truth as sacred and really like become the uber mensch that i think you're talking about is like mm -hmm. that that's what a hero is under like the non leftist religion framework in their framework though if you adopt it i think you you are no longer com cognizant of the facts that contradict or it's so hard for you to see them because you've adopted this simplistic worldview that where right. everything makes sense to you intuitively and emotionally um on the, all these you know and all these different narratives whether it's uh about you know black people being victims and i need to be their white savior and and i'm the hero in that story because i can if i you know, fight all the evil Republicans, then, I, you know, I'll fix right. things. It, it's, it's this repeated thing, but it's so, it's very simplistic and narrow minded. And it doesn't usually, um, it can't deal with facts that contradict it and it ignores them or, or suppresses them rather than, um, confronts them. I guess, yeah. I mean, most, many of these people might have an insecurity, right? I would think many people Which on the people? left have insecurity. I think when people si or anyone sign themselves, lies. I think it's like when you, when you like, when you make the religion comparison, it's like most Christians are not going on reading the Quran. Most Muslims are not going on reading about Buddhist ideology. It's like, once you've consigned yourself m to a religion, that is the religion that you fall into. And when you hear stories or things that may fall outside of that religion, you will find a way to fit that within the ideology that you currently subscribe to, which is what the left does. It's what I did on the left. When somebody told me, well, what about this fact from blah, blah, blah? Well, I would go, well, I would look through my ideology and go, okay, well, it's either patriarchal or it's white yeah. supremacy or, and it fits under this bubble. So obviously that's a white supremacy thing. Obviously that's capitalism. Obviously that's patriarchy. And I think it's the same thing that anybody does in any religion because you've already subscribed yourself to that being the truth. It's like Jordan Peterson talks about like, the maps of meaning. That mm -hmm. is, you're given a map of meaning, like you already have this preset um, picture of narrative that right. you believe about the world. And then whatever you see, whatever you experience, whatever you see in your newsfeed, on social media, whatever happens to you in life, you assign meaning to the phenomena that you um, witness uh, within that map that you already have. And so it's right. more a matter of like, how do you like to change your mind? Your whole map has to fall apart. And mm -hmm. it, for that to happen, it usually has to fail you so dramatically that you finally can poke a hole in it and question the thing that you've believed in. And then, and usually that's like, I don't know, an, an undeniable um, thing that has happened to you that, that you just have the, the ground that I thought was firm footing mm -hmm. gave way. And now, um, what are you left with? And most, it's like most people, it's so hard to change their minds though, because they have an existential need for that map to remain intact. Yep. And so you would literally rather like lie to yourself or, um, you know, sub commit atrocities than mm. allow your religion to, you know, crumble um, because you need it to be true. It's not something that you just, it's true because you've looked, you've dispassionately looked at the evidence and, and really like looked at facts and like, oh, I, I, it's, it's because you've staked your entire sense of personal meaning on, you know, this black lives matter 
stuff or yep. whatever narrative it may be. And you need it to be true in order for you to have meaning in your life. And that's never a good place to be if if you care about actual truth, objective truth. Right. It's like I think about myself and like when I got this tattoo, it's essentially religious branding. That's mm. it's honestly what it is. And to have that crumble in front of you and go, well, wow, I branded myself with this ideology and I subscripted myself to this. And now I'm looking, I'm stepping outside of the, the worldscape or the map that I've been on my entire life. That's a difficult thing to do, mm -hmm. which is why the indoctrination is so evil. And that's why I think Will's onto something when he talks about like building yourself as an individual mm -hmm. is a way, is the way to, you know, not be, be, be beholden to any of these ideologies that make you blind to yep. truth. It's the it's only a, way. Yeah. It's yeah. the only way. Again, yeah. What is your what is your locus of control? Is it outward of you or is it inward of you? And if it's not inward of you, then you're obviously super susceptible to all of these things. Whether that's like right wing extremism or it's left wing extremism, you are susceptible uh, so long as you don't know who you are as a person. Like Dostoevsky said, it's better to go wrong in your own way than right in someone other someone else's way. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you made the decision to do something that might have given you a mistake that you can learn from mm -hmm. instead of you doing the right thing that someone else wants you to do. Yeah. That's like mm -hmm. much better. That's how you should be living your life is knowing that you have to make mistakes yourself to learn from it, but you're an individual and you get to do what you want versus, you know, having someone else tell you what you should do and, and doing the right thing that is according to them, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's, it's, it's like safe. Like you're talking about with collectivism, it's, it's safe to like go with the herd and outsource your critical analysis of your own existence and mm -hmm. what the truth is to the collective. Um, and, but, but that is, I don't know. You lose, you lose the truth. You lose yourself. You lose your individuality. And I think that's, what's special about America is we, it, it, the country was founded on the, this, these ideas of individuality of, yep. of sort of the Judeo Christian framework of, we hold these truths, like just truth itself, mm -hmm. um, being something that's objective, that's out there. It's not this postmodern subjective thing. And, uh, you know, dismantling all of that is not a great idea. That's what we're seeing these days. Yeah, it's Ooh, weird. Yeah. We hold these truths to be self-evident, but nobody has a self anymore. So Who's evident? <laughs> yeah. Who is evident? Now we're going to get into TikTok Tuesday, ladies and gentlemen. We have some not funny TikToks today. I apologize. They're, none of them are funny. Unless you find the women of The View funny. And well, in that case, God help you. Here is uh, off of The View. They did something called The Viewsical around Halloween and costumes for kids. Here's the video. Um, but for our interpretation, we took a little twist on it. Here we have our adorable COVID-19 vaccine, but we added a twist. We added the booster. We put an actual uh, kid's booster, my son's booster, on the back of the costume. Wait, pause. And our trick-or-treater is ready to go. She's got her COVID-19. His bag, is his bag a passport? On it? Is, is that what it is? Oh on my it? god, is it? I think so. Let's, look let's at go it. back look and look. look. Okay. We're gonna we look, get the twirl. We added the See, is it, is yeah. a passport? Oh, we right. put an actual... Like a vaccine passport I on his little a, baggie. I think that's a passport? I can neither confirm nor deny, but it does look like a passport. I'm only letting unvaccinated children get candy from my <laughs> house. Yo, are There's you a, vaccinated, yeah. kid? Prove yeah. that you I, haven't been. Yeah, vaccinated. prove that you haven't been vaccinated, <laughs> oh and you gosh. can get candy. No, these poor children. This poor girl. This, this is, is a girl, child abuse. This is a girl whose mother has gone and signed her up to do this, contracted her to be on the View in this co in this costume, and this is going to live with her for the rest of her life. <sighs> yeah, but you were on the View. Oh this my is Kind of a flex. <laughs> No, it's, it's not a, a it's, flex. This is the same thing as Greta Thunberg, like like parading kids out there for a political point. It's 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 exploitative <sighs> and it's wrong. And it's is like, this the only costume, or is there more? No, this is the only costume oh. in this clip. Oh, they're just trying so hard to, and you know what? I don't, I don't understand like. They're like, oh, those unvaccinated people will really be persuaded if we parade a child out here that's dressed in this costume. Like, it's, is, what is what are you even trying to accomplish? It's the sides are already drawn. OK, I mean, the, like the people who want this kind of stuff, they know what they want. And the people who don't don't. I think it's like maybe there's a very small minority of people who haven't chosen a side on what they're going to do yet when it comes to this kind of stuff. But they've like made it pretty clear what they want. 
And so is the other side. I mean, it, and it's not even about it's sides. Tough. It's like the people have made their personal decisions. Everyone who wants the vaccine has had ample opportunity to get it for free mm-hmm. right. for, I don't know, how long has However it been? Long. Months yeah, and months, months and months. They have it at the airport now. now. Yeah, you can even get vaccinated at the airport for free while you're waiting for your flight. You know, you talked a minute ago about like the idea of that of insecurity. And if you if you are secure in your personal choice on these matters, then like what is driving the need for you to be like parading this around incessantly in front of everyone else and like dressing up your kid like this and having Stephen Colbert dance around, you know, next to people dressed up as needles. Like it's, it's almost, it feels like an insecurity of like, I made the right decision, right? Like, you know, I think it's, it's more than that. It's that they have ties to the U S government who tells them we need more people to get vaccinated and you guys are the keepers of the culture. So you need to, you need to advocate for this. You need to find a creative way to convince people that they need to be vaccinated. And if that's through, I don't think they need the government to tell them to do that though. I think there's, there's enough of like this, this self-righteousness driving it to be like, to, to you think you're, it's like the narrative we just talked about before. Like I'm the hero. And unless everyone gets vaccinated, then we're not going we, you know, like, we're all going to die. And so I'm the hero in the situation. If I persuade more people and I'll be patted on the back, the more I'm out there seen as somebody who's persuading other people. But I think the, that's a much more likely like explanation than like someone's behind the I combination. I think that's like the normal people, but then Amal is right on like what it's like. The combination, level. the combination of all these different shows doing, Vaccine costumes, vaccine songs, vaccine musicals, running around the street like James Corden and talking to people about getting vaccinated and singing songs to them. The fact that this is all happening in lockstep is not just a matter of, oh, we are all coincidentally so self-righteous about this that we all feel the need to push the same thing. It's like the same thing with the, the Joe Rogan video that he put out, sponsored by Pfizer, sponsored by Pfizer, sponsored by Pfizer. All of these corporations are making millions, if not billions of dollars billions. from these vaccination companies and from the US government and they get write-offs for doing these things because it it follows an incentive that they have. I mean to your point there was the Clay Bogut the and former NBA player came out and he's an Australian one he said like the government tried to pay me right. to encourage people to get vaccinated and so I don't deny that there's like a, a concerted effort but I just I think the that people are I don't know. I think people are concerted effort simply motivated by like their psychology is vulnerable and people's psychology is driving them to like virtue signal. That is such an obvious thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Stephen Colbert is going to, he feels self-righteous by writing, you know, doing this type of stuff. And he feels, he knows he's going to be pat on the back by New York times and everyone else who also feel self-righteous about virtue signaling about all this stuff. And they feel sanctimoniously like they can, you know, tamp down their ideas on the other side and they can demonize, villainize the other people. And it makes them feel better that they're like winning the battle by like, you know, cat, casting everyone who won't get vaccinated as like this negative thing. I think it's as simple as that. I don't think it needs to be that much deeper. I think there are other stuff going on beneath it and behind the scenes, but I don't even think you need that. I think it's a corporate exploit of that natural human tendency. That's what I think. And I think they've gotten the ability to make them do that because they are self-righteous people. But at the baseline, at the foundation of it, these corporations are not doing things that don't make them money. So where is the money coming from? Because it's not coming from the millions of Americans who refuse to watch these shows that are trying to indoctrinate them. It's not coming from the average uh, American who turns on the TV at night. It's coming from the corporations and the sponsors of this. And if ABC, MSNBC, CNN, and they are all coming out with sponsored by Pfizer, of course, of course, they're going to go along with what their sponsors want to see on their program. They they no longer care. Then they use that to make people feel that way. Yes. To make them feel exactly like Taylor's saying. Yeah, it's the cyclical thing of I'm going to give you money, but also you're going to feel great about why I'm giving you money. And you're going to feel great and I'm going to continue to do it and I'll do it for Stephen Colbert. I'll do it for Jimmy Fallon. I'll do it for all these networks. And they all work in tandem. World savers. It's like those news clips that you see, those news compilations of them all saying the same thing, the same statement over and over and over. And it's news from Texas and Florida and Los Angeles and and New York. And they're all saying the exact same stuff. Well, let's not kid anyone. The kid is pretty cute. (laughs) <laughs> the I can't even see the kid. Cute. It's covered in like boxes and like <laughs> the little hat. It's kind of cute. It's adorable, but it's so sad. Which yeah. makes it worse. Yeah, they're using makes this kid's worse. cuteness to I know push their agenda. Stop using cuteness against me. Yeah, just stop. Just stop using the children. Taylor, stop using your cuteness against me. Scott, Scott, stop it. Scott. <laughs> 
You're but so persuading. Anyways, that was our <laughs> can't resist. A funny, sad, I guess, cute <laughs> TikTok Tuesday for you guys. Oh, uh, we're just doing one TikTok. I had another one, but it's just very serious, and it's about critical race theory. I figure we should end on this uh this high note from the View. Oh, that was a high note. That was a that's, palate cleanser. That's a high note. That Joy Beha my... is this kid coming out here with <laughs> uh. the vex. <laughs> Vex uh, costume, you know. Is that Joy Bear? <laughs> no, it's not Joy Bear. I was gonna I say. Think about I was like, yeah, yeah, no, I don't even know what Boston. she sounds like. Yeah. I was watching videos of the View this morning, hey. and that it's tragic. It's a tragic show. It really is. Oh good. My mom sometimes watches the View still. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. June sits and watches the View. Uh huh. And then she and we'll talk on the phone, and she'll be like, "You should have heard what Whoopi said." <laughs> I'm like, "Lay it on me, mom. Tell me." Uh, apparently, a lot of people watch that show. Of I course. Mean, yeah, it's a big show. Even though it's yeah. a huge big echo chamber. And then show. there's also The Talk. The Talk? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's called The Talk. It's with the Asian lady from Big Brother. She Never like heard of her. People, and it's like the same thing. And they, and it's with the Ozzy Osbourne. Sharon some, Osbourne? Sharon Osbourne. Okay. And it's like, it's like The View. Osbourne. It's like The View, but with different <laughs> women. Okay. Well, what is know? this all about? What like, is this? You know, it's like you the, know, the View. Talk. It's, like it's the, the show. The, it's so always like the women and they yeah. and they're talking at a table. Oh. It's a good thing, you know. I think that impression is a great way to end the show. Well, do you want to give the sign off in that voice? Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching our show today. We had a good show. You know what I'm talking about. If you want to listen, you can't hear. Uh, you can't watch because your eyeballs don't work. Then you can, go to, you can go to Spotify, uh, Google Play, uh, Apple. Apple Podcasts, rate us five stars, and listen to us e every day you can. Oh, so I'm, wow. I'm Joy Behar, and oh. <laughs> this is what I sound like now. <laughs> also, guys, we have a survey down below in the description talking about what you love, hate, and would wish to change about Will and Amla Live. Go and fill out that survey. It also asks you about other PragerU content that you may watch, and you can leave a little note for us that we may read on the show. So go fill out that survey in the description, and we will be back tomorrow at 2.30, 5.30 Eastern. See you guys. Peace.